So my first disclosure is one that I don't have any financial disclosures, but more importantly, I am a dermatologist. I'm going to be speaking about radiation therapy. So there's probably some radiation oncologists in their grave that are turning over right now, but I have had the wonderful opportunity to work with Dr. Philip Devlin, who is our radiation oncologist at our Dana-Farber group. And he's a wonderful person, and everything I know about radiation is from him. So you can grade him on my talk afterwards if it doesn't happen to be above average. So in one way, a dermatologist giving a talk on radiation may actually be beneficial because I have to take a step back and actually understand truly what radiation is. And so I hope to get across today kind of some basic points and not take up too much time because I know this is kind of the end of the afternoon and, and uh, conferences can start to become a little bit tiresome. But the definition of radiation is that it's the transfer of energy from one place to another by means of particles or waves. And so we have two main types. We have ionizing radiation and we have non-ionizing radiation. And so non-ionizing radiation does not have the ability to actually ionize an atom or excite it to make it lose its electrons. Examples include sunlight, microwaves, things that we're in contact with every day. That's in contrast to ionizing radi radiation, where there's enough kinetic energy in that particle or wave to interact with the atom, cause the atom to actually lose its electrons. And so we have to think about how radiation actually works. So radiation works because the photon or electron enters into the skin or cell and causes water molecules to ionize. Those water molecules then give off free radicals, which is pretty much like buckshot from a shotgun, that then can go into the DNA, cause damage to the DNA. That's the instruction manual, as we talked about earlier, but unless the cell is dividing, it really doesn't need that instruction manual. But when a cell is dividing, then it notices the damage, it can't repair it, and it dies. And so radiation targets proliferating cells. And so if you take that a step further, Great, it's targeting the malignant cell, but it's also targeting normal cells that are proliferating. And so if we could come up with an ideal therapy, it would only target the malignant cell and not target the normal cells. And so radi radiation oncologists, their whole plan is to treat the tumor and try to spare as much of the surrounding normal tissue as possible. Okay. For today, we're only thankfully talking about two types of ionizing radiation, photons. Photons can either be X-rays or gamma rays, and they do not have an inherent charge. Electrons, which have a negative charge. Now, we've gone from ionizing, non-ionizing. We're in the ionizing radiation portion. We're going to break that down into external radiation. And that's where an X-ray or electron comes out of a machine called a linear accelerator, and I'll show a picture of that in the next slide. And it pretty much amps up that subatomic particle, the linear accelerator, so that it has a lot of energy coming out of the machine. It is absorbed in human tissue to the depth in the field required. People much smarter than myself and computers much smarter than myself come up with algorithms to, to allow you to actually target how deep the, the electrons uh, go into the tissue. And we have localized electron beam therapy. We're only treating a certain uh, patch or plaque or tumor of uh, B cell or T cell lymphoma or total skin electron beam therapy where we're treating the whole skin. Here's a picture of the linear accelerator. There's, um, it energizes the particles, which then are shot out of here to the target of interest. And here's an example of electron beam therapy um, and the response over time. And so you can see a large tumor on the upper right shoulder that at five weeks is starting to melt away, and at eight weeks has actually completely melted away, and you can see diminution of a bunch of the other lesions with the therapy. That's localized electron beam. Total skin electron beam puts the linear accelerator farther away from the patient so that the electrons can then spread out. And what we try to do is get a uh, dose of radiation to the whole surface of the skin. Electrons, by their nature, cannot penetrate too far into the skin, which actually makes it an ideal therapy because it doesn't go beyond five centimeters into the tissue because it mitigates any sort of damage to the internal tissues. And so we really are targeting the skin primarily in this therapy. Here is an example of a patient who underwent total skin electron beam with multiple uh, thick plaques and four months later actually was uh, lucky and had a complete response. So, we're talking about linear accelerators so far. What I'd like to now do is something that they call sometimes internal radiation because it, it 
a lot of times prostate cancer patients get radioactive pellets placed into the prostate, which is a form of treatment. Take that concept and put it where we take the radiation and actually overlay it onto the uh, skin. And so that is called brachytherapy. And what happens is a, a radioactive isotope goes over the area that you're interested to treat and it treats the cutaneous lymphoma very similar to the way that prostate cancer is treated. So it is a short range radiation. It's precise because you can actually make a mold over curved surfaces so that the catheters are able to roll over the skin um, and be able to treat complex surfaces. And so the ideal is getting uniform doses around curved surfaces. Because if you want to treat point A right here, if it goes away, if the skin starts to curve or any part that you're trying to treat, you lose a square of the dose. So it's really important that uh, there's a therapy that can, has the ability to treat curved surfaces. So the important point I want to leave with you today is that brachytherapy is for complex targets, superficial and deep, whereas electrons are wonderful for flat surfaces like, like backs or chest. It depends on the area that you're treating, at least at Dana-Farber and how, which radiation that we choose to, to use to treat with our patients. I will keep this as simple as possible, but um, it is used for palliation. It is not used for curative. We do like to see skin lesions go away and stay away, but this is really a palliative treatment. Electrons are for flat surfaces, brachies for complex surfaces. Now, the GY here is a measure of ionizing radiation. And what the community that's treating CTCL and cutaneous B cell lymphomas have started to notice over the last many years is that doing lower doses, you still get good responses as opposed to what it was in the past, like 30 or to 36 gray, and you're minimizing the side effects from the radiation. So a lot of places that are treating CTCL and cutaneous B cell lymphoma are using low dose because these cells are inherently radiosensitive. They, they, they die quite uh, quickly with low doses of radiation. So T cell, we're using four gray and the multiplier times two. So that means four gray with two sessions of therapy and B cells, two gray times two sessions. If it doesn't go away, occasionally it needs to be retreated to a higher dose. And that's another benefit of doing the low dose. In, in days past when we did definitive dose, the skin can only take so much radiation and we couldn't retreat that spot. With lower dose, we at least have the opportunity to go back and retreat it again if we need to. Okay. Some of the, the results that have been published, it has very good clinical responses with few relapses. Um, in one paper, Electron Bean, they looked at 270 lesions, 96% complete response, meaning that the skin looks clinically normal in the spot that was treated, not all of the skin lesions went away. With only four infield treatment failures, so within the region treated, those lesions did very well. Brachytherapy, 31 lesions have been reported, treated on complex surfaces like the face, feet, and hands. In those papers, there's a 100% complete response rate and only one infield treatment failure. But I have to, there's a caveat that we've only followed those patients for just one and a half years. And so we really are interested in following that over a longer period of time. And here's some of the success that we've seen with it. This is a syringotropic CTCL, meaning that the malignant cells like to hang around the sweat follicles. And this patient was contemplating uh, getting an amputation. And after two sessions of four gray, we were very surprised, he's our poster child essentially, that he uh, is clinically clear and has actually remained clear for six years now. This is another example of a patient who had folliculotropic CTCL, so her plaques were getting thicker on her scalp. Eight weeks after therapy, she lost her hair, which is what you can expect after radiation therapy, but her lesions had responded quite nicely. And for her, she was very excited that six months later, she had complete regrowth of hair. So using the low dose, we can get hair regrowth. But oftentimes, patients notice, and she did, her hair was not curly before, and it's curly after. So you can get a change in the texture and the color of the hair after radiation. Now let's talk just a little bit about uh, total skin electron beam. Uh, this was a summary of three phase two trials, 33 patients, 12 gray, which is the low dose variant in total skin. Overall response rate was excellent with 88%. 90% of the patients had a complete response, so their skin looked clear. And duration of benefit was a median of 70 weeks, which is quite a long time. Toxicities were mild and reversible, and if they needed it, they could be treated again. So when do we use radiation in the management of our patients? 
most often we're using localized therapies in the earlier stages and usually to a recalcitrant lesion. This is not something we jump to right away, but if they're not failing, they're failing some other skin directed therapies, then we start to think about using uh, radiation, either brachytherapy or localized electron beam. Total skin electron beam can also be used, but generally these patients have more lesions. Um, occasionally, electron beam is being used before transplants now with the idea of trying to treat all of the bad T cells before they actually get the transplant uh, therapy. But more research needs to be done whether that is actually efficacious and shows a, a benefit compared to just what we do standard. So. The last minute or two, what I'd like to do is, is just kind of walk you through, if you do decide to, if your team comes up with doing radiation, you agree to it, what happens? So for electron beam and brachytherapy, the first appointment's a simulation, where the radiation therapist takes pictures of the skin and really tries to simulate what the day of treatment's actually going to be like, and this usually takes one hour. And essentially what they do is they put stickers on to mark the area that is actually clinically affected, and then give you usually around a two centimeter area because we can't see the malignant cells easily. So we're trying to treat as much of the potential spread underneath the skin that's not clinically inflamed as possible. Then for brachytherapy, you get multiple catheters and they figure out what's the best way to align those catheters for treatment. They then spend a lot of time getting the tape and the um, uh, other things necessary to keep things in place so that the catheters don't move during your treatment sessions. And it with the point of being a reproducible and stable setup for the patients. And then, importantly, in spots that you don't want to have radiation going to, you need to use protective shields or bandages. This is the part that is way above my pay grade, but this is the computer algorithm that allows you to actually, what Dr. Devlin likes to call, is paint the dose onto the skin. And so this yellow line here is actually what the ISO dose is, meaning that the dose is going to be the same all throughout this line. So the idea again being that it's only treating the skin where it's affected, and then this is the 50% fall off point. So this is where any radiation beyond that it's not going. So you're really trying to spare the normal tissues underneath. How about how long does it take? The day of treatment is usually around 30 minutes, depending on how uh, the physician is running on time or not, but it's mostly spent on positioning, and the actual treatment only takes a few minutes. Total skin, you have to stand on a platform in some centers, they actually have a rotational platform, so you remain in one um, uh, body position, but in other centers you actually have to do these different body positions so that we make sure that we're getting as much of a uniform dose as possible to those positions. And then depending on the area treated, you have to either have goggles, shields, um, on certain anatomic structures. So for our low dose regimens with localized electron beam or brachy, there's just three appointments. One's the planning, the other two are treatment days. In total skin, there can be eight to 12 appointments depending on the center and if you're doing the low dose regimen. So what are the side effects? The point here is that with a the localized therapy, the side effects are almost always only within the, the area treated. Um, and that can be skin that becomes red, dark, dry, irritated, or sore around your lips if your face is treated. You can expect some hair loss, but it does regrow. You may sweat less. You may experience swelling. For patients getting total skin with a low dose, it doesn't happen quite as frequently, but fatigue can happen two to three weeks after treatment. And occasionally patients do report loss of appetite. So to conclude, cutaneous T cell and B cell lymphoma are overwhelmingly radiosensitive. Electrons we generally use for flat surfaces. Brachy we use for complex surfaces. Trials are needed to, um, more trials are needed to see what optimal dose there really is for this therapy with minimizing uh, side effects and if there's combinations of therapies that work best with radiation. And then total skin, uh, the low dose regimen seems to be an excellent uh, choice for palliation of, of skin symptoms. So thank you very, very much and uh, I think we'll go to the panel and take questions. After whole skin radiation therapy, is it routine to follow this with systemic chemotherapy or is it usually a wait and see opportunity to determine if anything else is needed? So you have to think about the anatomic compartments that are affected by the CTCL. So if the blood and the lymph nodes are not involved and it's only the skin, then generally I would say, and anyone can jump in with their experience, because I'm the guy who looks like he's 16 years old, and these, <laughs> the people on this uh, panel have more experience than I do, but uh, you see how the response is. And, and in general, systemic chemotherapy is not needed because it's not 
if it's not in the blood or, or but it depends on, on which anatomic compartments are affected with, with the malignant T cells. Um, there have been some studies that have shown PUVA after total skin electron beam has, long to a, has led to a longer um, period of remission than if they didn't get PUVA afterwards. But though it, we're, we're still trying to figure out what the exact combination regimens before and after are to get our best responses. Good question. Yeah, and I would say in, in, certain, um, in certain settings, in addition to um, PUVA, you might sometimes see other skin-directed therapies employed, like nitrogen mustard might be used after total skin electron beam, to, once again, to maintain the remission. Interferon is used in certain settings um, after total skin electron beam. So it really depends on where you're getting care. But the most important concept is really sort of maintaining the remission. So oftentimes something is added about a month after you complete treatment. For multiple lesions on the face, including tumors, is it more efficacious to use the brachytherapy or electron beam because the surface seems more complex? So brachy would probably be the route that we would go because of how complex that the facial lesions are. But there also may be a discussion if another therapy is actually better suited at first. and so it is all in the context of the discussion with the multidisciplinary team about what they think is the best way to treat that. But if, if radiation was thought to be the best, at least at Dana-Farber, we would do brachytherapy to those spots. Excellent. Okay, we've got a question back here. Um, uh, if you do the total skin um, uh, radiation, which is what I've done, um, and uh, I saw it, your chart said that uh, there was one patient that had palliative uh, remission for 70 weeks. Um, is it something that's repeated um, after that? Um, because it doesn't really ever really go away. Uh, I think it depends a bit on what dose you got. So in the old days when we used to just do full dose, uh, which was 36 gray or 8 to 10 weeks of treatment, it was believed that the maximum number of times you could do total skin was three. Um, I've only had one patient who did three. I've had a couple patients do two. But there is a limit. Um, with low dose, obviously then, you know, you probably could repeat it uh, more times than, than that. But it is true that total skin is very effective, but it is strong. So it's not, it's something we use less than we do with phototherapy or our topicals. Um, so that's just one thing to keep in mind. But yes, you can repeat courses. Kind of a similar type question. Just if you did the electron beam, it was like eight gray. And as you said, was that also limited to two doses? Or if you have the electron beam, you can actually, if it regrows or comes back three years later, I can go back for more of the same. So different people, I think radiation oncologists feel comfort, have different limits to how many times that they would retreat. But um, when you're only doing eight gray, I mean, definitive dose used to be 30 to 36 gray, depending on the person. So you could potentially keep treating till you've accumulated up to that, right. But. The thought then too is, is why does it keep coming, like whether keep treating the same lesion even though it keeps recurring, it may be a better idea to s start thinking about something something else potentially. Is there a question from home? Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say sometimes with a recurrent lesion like that, we might even think about doing a skin biopsy just to see if under the microscope the behavior of that lesion has maybe changed over time and, you know, gives you thoughts about other options for treatment. Can radiation be used on open lesions or lesions that are not healing? So uh, radiation therapy can be, so um, when lesions are open, I think that um, there are usually two reasons why they're open. One could be because it's ulcerated because it's a tumor. So most tumor lesions, if they get thick enough, they will ulcerate just as a part of their natural behavior. And in that setting, yes, you certainly could do radiation, and some would argue that radiation therapy is first-line treatment, localized um, radiation's first-line treatment for ulcerated tumors. For um, th those of us um, in the multidisciplinary group, whenever somebody has an ulceration of the skin, we do look for signs and symptoms of infection. 
So if there are signs and symptoms of infection, we do try to clean that up or treat that um, a bit first um, and, and then, you know, proceed with radiation after that. Um, so th those are the thoughts that run through my head. Uh, for sensory patients, what is your opinion on dose-sparing regimens for ramadopsin? Do you feel that a dose-sparing approach instead of the traditional three weeks on, one week off regimen can prolong the response? So we're missing an oncologist here on this panel. Um, so, but I, um, I was involved in um, the Romidepsin phase two trial, so I, I, I did personally treat patients um, with it on that trial that led to approval, but it's been a while since I've used it. Um, so I think the, the question relates to um, dose reduction means the lower dose of um, usually the, the initial dose of Romy is 14 mg per meter squared, IV once a week, three weeks in a row on, one week off. Um, and I think the dose reduction can either mean a lower dose, like 10 mg per meter, meter squared, or it could be just an alternate dosing regimen, like one treatment every other week. So I'm not exactly sure. Usually we try to push full dose first. Okay, I think most people try that first, and then we look at whether they're tolerating it. So if side effects are strong, um, and uh, the patient, we want the patient to still stay on therapy, then I think most medical oncologists would then dose reduce, um, and then try to keep them, you know, on the drug a little bit longer. Um, but of course, if the disease doesn't respond to the lower dose, then you have to rethink that approach. I was going to say, I, I treat a fair number of patients with romadepsin, and we try and get patients, if we can, based on side effects, at least through six cycles. So that's, once again, the commitment of three weeks on, one week off. It's, um, I'm sure that Jack would share with us that it's a long time in the infusion room, so you get to know your infusion nurses really well. You're there four to five to six hours with all the befores and afters. But once, you know, skin improves and blood improves, the question is, what do we do? Do we stop treatment because we've completed six cycles and wait and see? And sometimes that is what happens. Uh, but then some of my patients aren't really comfortable with the wait and see because they've achieved a remission and maybe they haven't with other therapies. So in our center, we've had a couple patients. There's no cookbook for this. There's no papers to, that have been written to date that I'm aware of in cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, but there have been in peripheral T-cell lymphoma about how to deliver the drug maybe differently. So what we have done for some patients is just elongate their, their time between cycles. So we still kept them to that three-week commitment but then we give them three weeks off and then we'd do the three-week commitment again and then give them six weeks off and over the course of a year to two years or three years look to see if we've been able to maintain the remission and oftentimes over time patients will be ready to let go of the drug because it's sort of time to go move to surveillance so that is you know an option um, I've been going for narrow band UVB for three and a half years um, for first two years were three times a week. Now I'm down <clears throat> down to two, but we were away earlier this year, and I <clears throat> missed treatment for like two months, and it started coming back um, on my back. It was um, uncomfortable, but it you know I, I put the fluosinonide <clears throat> on and got rid of it. Uh, thoughts, comments. Um, my doctors at Sloan want me to continue, you know, one or two times a week, and I have been doing that now. Uh, does it ever end? <laughs> That's a very good question. Any takers? So I think us researchers hope someday that it will end, but a lot of our therapies are, are they're all palliative. The only curative therapy is, is stem cell transplant. And so what I tell my patients is that especially early stage patients who have an excellent prognosis, is that this is going to be an annoying rash that you live with. And so your story is not uncommon. I see it all the time. It's good that it responded nicely to topical steroids. But that's part of the team aspect of care. Uh, with the, the discussion between you and the, the physician about what your goals are, how um, well things are working, and then discussing the, the risks and the benefits of any, any treatment therapy. Um, narrow band UVB over a period of time can sometimes theoretically increase your skin cancer risk, although it hasn't been clearly shown in, in, the, uh, in the data. But um, 
it sounds like you were an excellent responder to, to narrow band UVB, and so it's a it's a constant discussion. But I think the bottom line is is that it often does recur, and that that is an issue that we are actively trying to address in the in in the lab and and studying our patients. What response have you seen with Doxel, and what kind of side effects? Um, you know, I think like uh, I think like all of the cell killing chemotherapy, chemotherapy, chemotherapies, the durability isn't great. It's usually around six months, um, and um, so where it fits in depends on each individual patient's. The side effects of Doxel, depending on, once again, if you've been exposed to a lot of internal treatments, a lot of systemic treatments, um, it can affect your, your red blood cells and your, your infection-fighting cells, et cetera. So if you've been naive to systemic treatments, you may have no changes in your counts. One of the big side effects for um, my patients that receive Doxel is something called PPE, where their palms of their hands and the soles of their feet can get red and very tender and inflamed or edematous, and that can, be, that can be a reason certainly to cut down the dose or for some patients to even stop the drug. And it's a real side effect and really affects quality of life. I don't know if you guys have any uh, The first part of this was prompted by Fran's question. Uh, I've been 1A, and uh, I started out with, um, what do you call it, uh, the light therapy twice a week, then got tapered off to once a week, now I'm once every two weeks, and Dr. Geskin is talking about maybe we're going to look at it for a little bit, but maybe might even be able to go to once a month. So my question, that was just an observation, but the, uh, subsequent, you said that um, 30 years ago they thought being clear was the best thing since sliced bread, but maybe not now. Why would it not be so great to be perfectly clear? That's not clear to me. <laughs> Sorry. That, that's an excellent question. Um, so I think that, um, that previously it was felt that if you decrease the, the tumor burden or number of cancer cells that are on the skin, then there's less chance of one of those cells mutating and, and turning into a more aggressive cancer, so preventing progression. Okay, that was the thought, which makes a lot of logical sense to pretty much anybody when you think about it. Um, and so the thought was that you should treat the whole body. In the old days, they, they really did favor phototherapy or full body nitrogen mustard to just really eradicate all the skin activity. Um, the problem is, is that those kind of skin therapies do have long-term side effects on the skin in terms of PUVA, as you know, can cause skin cancer risk. And there was some concern that nitrogen mustard for years and years and decades and decades could cause skin cancer risk theoretically. Um, so. And also, there is a complete lack of data to really say that aggressive treatment of early stage skin disease prevents progression. There's no objective data to prove that. And then the last point is that some of us dermatologists, we kind of look to the oncology literature, and we can see examples of indolent lymphomas, like follicular lymphoma, of the, which is B cell internally, or CLL where we don't have curative therapies and early stage disease is indolent. And so you can take an expectant or watchful waiting approach or just tolerate low level disease. And we say, okay, patients who have early stage disease, most people want to treat it. And we do actively treat it, especially with first diagnosis. But when it comes back, and it usually comes back, then we make a decision based on each individual patient about how actively we want to treat it and we look at their skin, if they're a skin cancer risk, if they have a history of melanoma, those modify our decisions. How young they are, as you heard early this morning from Dr. Hodak, we don't want to make a seven-year-old do phototherapy day after day for the next 80 years just to keep their skin clear when there's no proof that that really protects them from progression. Um, I know that there was discussion this week about uh, topical therapies that might be safe around the eyes. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. And then was there discussion about um, other options other than topical therapies and what people around the world, other doctors around the world are using in that area? Oh, well, we were with the right person. She gave the talk. Yeah. <laughs> 
So one of the interesting things about mycosis fungoides is some patients start to notice, or they notice from the beginning, that their rash likes to hide in body folds. Um, so it starts to concentrate in the eyelids or in the armpits or in the groin or between the, 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 um, the butt, buttock um, gluteal cleft area. It's a really sneaky disease. It really does start to hide, for some patients, not all, um, in those areas. And those areas are difficult to treat with many skin topicals um, because it's such sensitive skin. It's such thin skin, and it's also close to vital structures like the eyeball. So if you get MF on your eyelid, it's tough to treat, but it happens. So in a study that I presented in my um, 300, I think it was 45 patients that I've seen over five years, about 6% of patients had eyelid involvement. Half of them were early stage disease, half of them were late stage. And when we looked at therapies, now this is influenced by my practice, um, about two thirds, uh, three quarters of them had to do systemic therapy to clear their eyelid disease because topicals are really difficult to use. Like you can use topical steroids on the eyes, but if you use it too long, you'll get cataracts and glaucoma. So you don't want to use steroids too long on the eyelids. And then things like Targretin gel or Miquimod um, are irritating and they're kind of chapping. And then finally, nitrogen mustard, you definitely should not put on your, your eyelids. So we, we need to do more to get more topicals for the eyelid. And there's one for eczema that maybe some of you have used before your diagnosis. Um, they're, they're called the calcineurin inhibitors, or topical tacrolimus, pomecrolimus. Has anybody heard of that? Or Elodil or Protopic? OK. Cloderm. Yeah, Cloderm's a topical steroid. So, so topical, those are agents that are used in eczema, and they're not steroids, but they have been used on eyelids, and um, of course, carefully and cautiously. And so there's one group in Spain that's doing a phase two multicenter trial based on some basic science evidence that um, pomecrolimus can affect um, certain signaling patterns in the tumor cells. They're doing a pretty big phase two study looking at Elodil or pomecrolimus use you know, in MF to see if it's safe and to see if it works. And if that proves to be true, then that would be one topical that could be used on the eyelid intermittently and definitely probably safer than some of the other topicals.